If you're someone who loves the process of shooting film and the results you get from it, you might have gotten to the point where you've considered getting paid for it, or maybe you're already a photographer and you're thinking of integrating film into your work. This video is going to discuss the reality of getting paid for film, what I've learned through my experience, and just some points to consider. So it's going to be a bit of a longer sort of talky video, but if that's a topic for you, stick around and I'll try and break it down point by point. Okay, so let's get into it. I wanna break this down into a few categories and the first one I wanna discuss is the why of it. Why do you want to start integrating film into your work? Or why, if you're already a film photographer, do you wanna start getting paid for it with film specifically, which is difficult in this day and age of digital. So for me, and a common one for a lot of people, I'm sure, is the enjoyment and passion that you can get out of film photography. I was someone who was uh, growing up in the day of film, learnt photography at uni and they started transitioning into digital, got back into film and that reignited a lot of my enjoyment and passion, brought that back into my photography. So I love shooting film until today. It's what caused this channel to start, enjoyment and passion for the process and the results. So naturally, you might want to channel that into your paid work. And uh, I think that's a fair enough reason because I'm the same. And I personally want others to appreciate the same things about film as I do, whether it's my clients or friends. And yeah, if you get clients, you might uh, think that they would enjoy the result and that's good enough reason. All right. So it could be that it could be something else more strategic, like trying to break into the niche, but whatever it is, try and figure it out, figure out, sorry, what the why is for you. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about next point is the who question in terms of your client, who are you shooting for? Uh, think about your client, think about the reality of most clients out there for paid photography work. Because in my opinion, in reality, most clients don't care. They don't give a shit about the process, to be honest with you. They want results. They are ex having certain expectations of you as a photographer to deliver upon. So they might not really consider the process or know anything about or care about it at all, to be honest, um, even if a little bit. So sure, some do appreciate the extra passion and care and the nostalgia factor and the look of film, but even then they are concerned with results first. So you have to ask yourself, how do you deliver on those expectations? So keep that in mind if you haven't really considered that aspect. On the other hand, there are clients out there who are well aware of film photography and actually actively reach out for film specific work. So again, it's not the majority, majority of clients out there in my experience, whether it's uh, corporate events, weddings, you, you're going to get clients who don't really care or know anything about film. They just want nice photos. All right. But on the other hand, you have these few uh, clients, especially emerging these days who want or are aware of the analog look and reach out for it actively. So remember that that's not as common, but it's growing. And with the recent resurgence of things like Super 8 breaking into um, weddings, for example, you might get clients who actively reach out for it. And to be honest, sometimes they don't even know what it is that they like about it. They might just consider it something like a set of photography that looks vintage or grainy, or they then learn that it's film, or they then learn that this video was shot on Super 8 and it wasn't just an effect which it could have been for all they care. So again, they are more results driven, um, even if they are aware of film. So if they are aware of film to the point where maybe they're a film shooter or they're just aware of it through some other means and they actively reach out for it, that is going to be a minority. So keep that in mind. So of all these uh, categories, of both categories, something to ask yourself is what percentage of these potential clients, whether they are from you know the A or B awareness group, what percentage of them are willing to pay enough for you to justify shooting film? So that's another thing you need to ask yourself because not everyone who enjoys the look of film and hires you to shoot film is necessarily willing to pay for it in terms of uh, number one, covering your costs and number two, trying to make something out of it. All right, because film costs you more. If it's something like a casual portrait shoot, it's a little bit easier. There's more flexibility or if it's just something that you're shooting on digital, but you're just adding on a couple of rolls of film, that's a different story. It's a little bit easier and you might just get away with just including that maybe at a loss or barely just covering costs. And you might feel fine with that because your basis is shooting digital and you're getting paid based on that. On the other hand, if you're at the point where you're starting to get bigger gigs where they've specifically hired you for film work, maybe it's a big uh, fashion editorial, high pressure campaigns, 
really film focused job, maybe a, a wedding on mainly film or all film, that needs to be justified with higher costs. So make sure that the client is willing to pay for that. And we'll talk more about charging later on. So I'll put a separate category um, for that. Before we move on to that though, I want to discuss the the practicality, the logistics, the how. So how do you get into it? What do you do? Number one, are you already getting paid to shoot? Are you already a working photographer? Have you just started getting into paid photography work? If so, find ways to tack on film at first. It's a good way to ease into it. Maybe you're shooting a small event and you bring your film camera. You might discuss it with them. You might not. Make sure you cover your basis on digital first. We'll talk more about that later, but that's a way to do that, tacking it on. And you might need to do that at a loss at first or only just cover your costs. If you have discussed it with them and they're kind of somewhat aware of film or you have a discussion, maybe you can just cover the cost of the roles and the developing or both, either, whatever you want. So offering it as an extra option, you still um, need to be able to demonstrate the value to the general population who isn't very aware. And the best way to do that is through examples. You need to be able to show examples and demonstrate the value of film, whether it's the look or something that the client might like. Now, on the other hand, you might be someone who is not currently working as a photographer. You wanna break into paid photography work, but you're an active film shooter. You're passionate about film and you wanna get into photography with a film exclusive offering. You wanna only get clients who wanna pay for film work. And I've discussed that people out there have this uh, desire, which is fine. I get it, Uh, but you are making things harder for yourself. So that's, in my opinion, it's just going to be more difficult. If you want to break into getting paid for photography work, you're just starting off, but you want to do things that will only be shot on film and you're not really willing to get into digital, invest in the gear and shoot hybrid, it's going to be harder for you. So just, it's going to be a slower entry I think, in my opinion, in most cases, and also might mean shooting at a loss at first or a very low turn um, profit, maybe just covering costs and eventually making profit. So reconsider hybrid, I would say. Um, You might get to a point where it's your niche, you might tough it out, or you might just be, you know, really talented and or some other reason where you can break straight into getting high paid jobs on film only. Um, Either way, Once you break into that niche, you develop a portfolio and you're known for shooting film work or you can start to get the clientele, uh, then that would be awesome. So you could take that path. And if you want an example of that, check out M Jensen, who I've interviewed on the channel. She has a great portfolio of work that is actually hybrid. So she does shoot hybrid, but she also shoots a lot of film and she's developed this great balance where uh, she's got this unique portfolio that people actively hire her her based on her ability what she can deliver and it leans into that film look it's dependent on film so it's at least heavily dependent on it or leans into it whether she's shooting the digital shots and maybe giving a bit of an edit to look like film it's a cohesive portfolio that people pay for so that's a point that you could aspire to get to if you want to shoot film exclusive next point i want to go through is uh, gear and workflow now The more you lean into shooting on film exclusively or mainly or even hybrid, the more you need to make sure you know that film equipment and are familiar with it and that your familiarity stands up under pressure. Know your equipment well. Make sure you're proficient with it under not only pressure but speed and have that and have some contingency. All right. So what I mean by that is if you're going to shoot a wedding and your client's expecting film shots and you're charging them for it especially, You want to make sure you have a spare body and some spare batteries or other contingencies that might come up. Know what to do when things go wrong. That's another part of contingency, especially when shooting film only. If you're shooting film only, you're doing gig on completely film, you need to have multiple contingencies, not just one spare body, but two different backs, um, things that help when something goes wrong. Do a full run through of your equipment and what I would call a a pre-mortem. So not a post-mortem, but Imagine what could potentially go wrong before you head out onto a big, important shoot on film only because a lot more things can go wrong on film. What do you do if your meter stops working? Do you have a spare light meter? What happens if you're um, wrapping up a roll of 120 and there's no sticker or it ripped off? Did you bring rubber bands or some washi tape, etc.? Think of everything that can go wrong and make sure you're prepared for uh, things that you can imagine might go wrong. You can't account for everything, but you can definitely 
prepare for a lot. All right, so next thing I wanna to touch on here is the idea of hybrid. Again, if you are going to shoot hybrid, so I mean shooting digital and film together, which I would definitely recommend, make it as seamless as possible. Maybe you can use cameras that have the same lens mount. So for example, EF bodies or RF bodies, which adapt back and forth, but let's say I'm shooting 5D, I can bring my EOS 3. This combination uses the same lens mount. So it's easier, it's more seamless to bring less lenses, have familiarity, they have similar controls, similar ways of using them, and they, they pair quite well. So it just reduces friction. If you are in a different situation or maybe you're shooting Sony digital, but then a, a Canon AE-1 film camera, still think about how they complement each other in terms of what lenses you have for this camera and what lenses you have for that. And then more importantly, how good are you at switching back and forth between these two cameras, whether they're from the same brand or not, because there's bound to be differences, especially because one's film, one's not. So get proficient at switching back and forth. And again, reduce as much friction as possible when it comes to hybrid shooting. All right, hope that makes some kind of sense because it's definitely helped me along the way. Next category is about charging, invoicing, how much to charge people. So this is up to you, but you should aim to progress. All right, what I mean by this is that you might start doing gigs for free for your friends, and then you might get to a point where you start to cover the cost of film. So you maybe just covering the cost of the roles or you're starting to tack on film to your digital work. That's a progression there. And then you then progress to um, getting paid for your time. So you might be getting paid for your time shooting film, whether it's at a premium to what you would normally charge for digital or you're shooting film only, free covering costs and then getting paid for your time. And that rate is up to you again. So you might look up what people are generally charging in the place that you live. This varies a lot. But to be honest, I would just set this rate yourself, figure it out what you think your time is worth. Once you get to that point, consider how much you want to get paid for it. You might use the general, the average cost of other photographers as an anchor, but that's only gonna help you so far. You still need to figure out how much you wanna uh, charge for your time, especially if you are shooting film, which is higher pressure, it's a little bit more specialized, okay? The final progression is not just getting paid for your time, but then offering something unique as a service, getting paid for a unique package or service that the client is paying for without as much consideration for just hourly cost. So you start to offer something like packages, whether it's a, a portrait shoot package of whatever many hours, and this is the cost, that's a set cost. And it's not so much about how many roles you shoot, how many hours it takes, or, you know, you can figure that out, but it's just basically a progression of simply charging for your time, but getting to a point where your portfolio is that good. Um, you know, plenty of great examples of film shooters out there. I've already mentioned one, but someone, for example, might shoot weddings on film only and offer, let's say a four hour wedding package or up to six hour wedding package, you know, and have a certain cost for it. Could be 2000, whether it's four or five or six hours or something like that could be whatever, it could be 5,000, it's really up to you, but you can get to a point where you can progress beyond just charging um, just on an hourly rate, but giving something unique as a package, being known for this work, for shooting on film and having that sense of reliability. All right, the next part of this cost category is to make sure you're considering everything because film is more expensive to shoot. So you need to take into account the cost of the film rolls, any shipping if you bought them online, the developing, the scanning, what resolution did you need to get higher res scans for the clients requesting, you know, really high res for print, for example, your time for editing, if you're color correcting, if you need to edit those film scans into the digital photos that you shot, if you're doing hybrid and make sure they're all seamless, did that take you extra time? Negative storage costs, delivery, the client's going to request the negatives posted or archiving. What is it costing you? Calculate everything. And then of course, calculate what your time is worth. All right, so the last category is where things can go wrong. I just wanna go through a few things that in my experience are worth keeping in mind. Number one is having over enthusiasm for the process versus results. We've kind of touched on this, but don't fall into the trap where you get too enthusiastic about the idea of shooting film where you don't consider the results, the client's expectations as much as you should, okay? I've fallen into this trap in the past, gone out, maybe assisting on a shoot and was expected to take a few film shots, but then might've gotten too enthusiastic about um, getting the film shots where I didn't prioritize uh, at least getting the shots that the client was expecting. It's a bit easier if you're assisting, but just something worth keeping in mind. Uh, secondly is over-reliance on film or over-expectation in terms of what you can get out of um, your 
your process, your cameras. So it could be that you shoot a certain film stock and you, you generally get certain results under certain lighting, but then it somehow lets you down. You know, you might have had a bad light or underexposure or some, some other factor that you didn't account for. Just let yourself down. Your expectations weren't met and therefore your client might not have their expectations met as much as you would have liked. So uh, don't over rely on, on film or have too many expectations of it because many things can go wrong as we've already discussed. So thirdly, this kind of ties into the last one and that is to make sure you have clear communication with your client if you're going to shoot film. Because again, not many clients are familiar with it. You can't assume they know everything about how it works. Set expectations with each other. Explain the risks where necessary. So if you're uh, getting paid for the, the film work, you're not just sneaking a film camera on, getting a few extra shots. Uh, make sure your communication is clear. If you are just going to sneak in a, a film camera or a few extra shots or a roll on a shoot where you're mainly doing digital, Make sure you're getting those key shots on digital first, okay? So if you're not going to have that communication, make sure you're doing your job to the minimum standard that you expect of yourself, and then you can pull out the film camera and get those film shots, and then hopefully you can deliver them to the clients if they worked out, they love them, you're happy, you have something to add to your portfolio, they got a bonus, but you still got those key shots, you um, delivered the expectations first and um, didn't take too many risks there. So basically, yeah, make sure you have really good communication. And uh, if you are going to do something like shoot an entire wedding on Super 8, you need to communicate with your client the risks involved in that a role might not turn out. You could be shooting away and you might have a big failure that you, even though you tried to account for everything, things can still go wrong, especially if maybe the client didn't pay for a second shooter or you didn't um, account for in your invoicing having digital backup and then doing the Super 8 or something like that, right? Because things can go wrong. So make sure you communicate that to the client where necessary. All right, so that's pretty much everything I wanted to discuss in this topic of the reality of getting paid for shooting film, integrating it into your existing film work, getting into photography through film. I think it's great. I personally love still integrating film where I can. I am not personally at a point where I market myself for film exclusive stuff or uh, over rely on film to the sense where I have that portfolio that's known for just shooting film and I actively just seek out mainly film analog based gigs, but I shoot hybrid. So I kind of get a little bit of the best of both worlds, not as much risk involved. And there's honestly more clients out there if you are willing to shoot hybrid and do um, most of your work on digital and then occasionally get that film work. So that's my opinion on that. You know, for example, I have a little wedding coming up. It's an intimate small wedding, but we're adding on just a couple of roles for a small cost that's basically just covering my costs for the film and processing. There's not really much or any profit in it, but I enjoy film that much that I'm willing to do stuff like that here and there. Because again, it's something I'm passionate about and hopefully you can um, reflect your passion through your photography as well, whether it involves shooting film or anything else. And then if you really want to take it seriously, work hard and you can build that portfolio of film-centric work that you can uh, eventually start having people reach out to you for, which would be awesome. So let me know if you have any questions. I am not the most experienced person out there. There's plenty of people out there who are more experienced in uh, being relied upon to shoot work on film, whether it's Super 8 or 35 or 120 or combination. So leave it in the comments because if I can't answer it, someone else with more experience might have uh, a better opinion and nothing wrong with having multiple opinions. So yeah, make sure to comment on the video. Let me know if this was helpful. And if you like this kind of discussion-based video, I don't do them too often, but I think that anyone out there who's willing to listen until the end of the video obviously is interested enough in this stuff to, to maybe hopefully get something out of it. So that's it. I'll leave you with that. I've got some exciting videos coming up from my recent travels to New Zealand where I did shoot a lot of film. So look forward to that and I'll see you on the next episode of Pushing Film.